Hello, everybody, and welcome to Yeshua Network. I'm Nathan Wheeler. And I'm Alex Slavovsky. And this, this is the entire Bible read-through. What? Yes! yes! We're back! <laughs> uh, I don't know what's scarier, the way I said that or the reference. Okay, welcome, you guys. <laughs> welcome back to Yeshua Network. Shabbat Shalom. Well, not really, but that's okay, Rihanna. It's just Shalom today. Uh, we love you. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, yes, for putting where you are from so everybody can connect, fellowship, meet up in real life, all those wonderful, wonderful things. We have amazing comments today. We are reading 1 Samuel 17 through 24. And you guys did a great job again. I don't care what Alex says. I, 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 I'm just kidding. He says only wonderful things about you. All right, I'm ready to go. Oh, by the way, I'm going on two hours of sleep, so Alex will be covering the rest of this. And um, you guys have fun. I'm going to go ahead and zone out now. Oh. Uh. We're in trouble now, folks. Okay, he really means it. All right, well, let's go ahead and start with the general questions. Let's see, we got, okay, 100 people. Here we go. Irina KD, you got a general question. Oh, okay, he's with us. Uh, <laughs> yesterday, I found my husband sitting in the bed, completely puzzled over some question. It is regarding the time that we experienced. As he is an atheist and I am a newborn Christian, we clashed over that issue. So I offered him to ask this question here as myself. I wasn't able to find the answer he was satisfied with. Below, he typed the question. And I would be very grateful if we could all answer it on this wonderful forum. His question. In the Bible, in Genesis, God created the earth and the universe in four days. Relatively speaking, and comparing that to the science, how much is how much is one God's day? Is it equal in solar system years? If not, why did the Bible change from God's days slash years to human years slash days later on in later stories? <clears throat> okay, so you got something to say? Oh, I'm I'm just watching. <laughs> oh, great, did, did, wonderful. No, I do. But if you, when you're done, I'll go. Well, you know, this is like a big, 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 big question, and this is a major, major stumbling block because when people first pick up the Bible, and they attempt to get into it and find out what it says, they'll hit that point, and everything they ever learned in life is going to clash against what they're reading. But you know, just having read this question and reviewed it again, uh, real quickly. The sun is not even around until the fourth day, so we can't. He can't possibly be talking about solar system days or Earth days or anything like that. So just take it as God day, whatever amount of time it is in our years. It really doesn't even matter, to be completely honest. It's impossible to know. It's impossible to know, and an impossible probably for him to communicate to us. And why would we even? It, it, it would mean absolutely nothing for our salvation and our relationship to him as well. But it does, it is a stumbling block for everybody who wants page one, word one, to answer all their questions. So, um, the best, like, there's lots of things we could say about the subject. There's lots of speculation. There's, there's lots and lots of theories that I have that I am satisfied with that we simply don't have the time to talk about now and, and really shouldn't necessarily talk about now. Um, um, you got anything you want to say about that? I am so happy that I don't have to say anything anymore. <laughs> I'm like a proud papa. <laughs> you have done well, young Padawan. Did I just mirror something you've said to me in the past? I probably just you did. did. And I it was did. it was perfectly executed, if wow. I'd say. So first of all, my only answer to this is simply this, you guys. Even though this video isn't about this, but I'm sure we all have this topic brought up to us. Uh, for the first three days, I think it was. Mm -hmm. First two days. No, first three days. No, four days. Yeah, on the fourth day is when he creates the, the big sun. lights in the sky, yeah. which is the so, sun and the moon. So there was no sun. Yeah. And as we know, a day is the rotation of the Earth. The Earth wasn't rotating around its own axis around a sun to get a day. So for anybody to think that the day, the Bible says very clearly what a day is. From the time that the Lord gave light to the time that the Lord didn't give light. And then since the first four days he was light, that could be the equivalent of our 50 billion rotations of the Earth. It could be bazillions and bazillions of them we have yeah. absolutely no idea but there was no sun until the fourth day according to the gospel and yeshua god sorry 
himself was the light. So, and then he replaced himself with an artificial light, which we call the sun. The sun is an artificial source of his light. It is a replica or a, a representation, a symbolic representation of his light. And so we don't know if the reason why he had to create that was because maybe life couldn't handle his light. Maybe, uh, you know, his light was so pure, so powerful. Maybe the, like radiation kind of spiritual realm, it would be blown away. So he was like, right. I got to make like a little rinky dinky and realize too, according to science, our star is even the biggest star in the galaxy. And not only that, but every planet spins at a different, of different rate. So a day doesn't even really, just to say a day, as we think a 24 hour period, doesn't even make make sense at all even scientifically because you can't you can't even say that the first day of earth the first rotation of the earth scientifically from when it went from a full circle according to the sun would not be even the same time frame as a day to day so you can't say what a day is you, there's no way of knowing even scientifically yeah. so so the day is like the experience of a day yeah uh, that's, but could that, take years or thousands of years or whatever. And that could be done that way for us to understand. The Lord had a goal for this day. He shined his light upon this, upon this. It starts out as, as it's just a mess of like, it's everything is empty and there's just water he's hovering it's over. It's like a big soup. And the earth is without form. So it may not even, even be a planet yet. I mean, the, you got to kind of think outside the box, outside sort of the matrix that you're in today, right? If you've seen the movie The Matrix. And if you really think about it, what he just said right there, if you really, really think about it, people who are trying to be scientific when they hear what the Bible says are not being scientific. They're thinking of a cartoon. They're thinking that God went Earth and the Earth is perfect. And then he said, rotate one time. Oh, and in that 24 hour period, I do this. And like it even says in the Bible itself, it, there was no form. There was there was muck. And there was everything was gas and liquid and other gas and other liquid and then he divided those gases and liquid which actually fit exactly what science says because science says that we are a gas galaxy and then the gases collect and harden and form other forms so actually that's kind of weird that people 6,500 years ago or so actually knew somehow that everything started in a gas liquid kind of state and then slowly formed into solids after first going into a liquid state. So if somebody is scientific and they do actually read the Bible, not think about what somebody told them about the Bible, the Bible actually is very accurate and makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing in there like, you know, uh, it was a big plate of land on top on the back of a giant turtle. And the elves <laughs> came out and they chiseled all trees in the first 24 hours. <laughs> and the unicorn but, came <clears throat> and pooped out rainbows. It doesn't but happen. Just to, just to, you know, I know we kind of we kind of attack this question, but it's it's fair for people obviously to to, to hit this and, and be like, what what does that mean? How does how do I reconcile that? And uh, there's something that happens that's amazing that is promised in the faith, um, and all of it takes time. You're not going to get all the answers right away. Some answers, some mysteries may not be revealed until you're in the next world. So you know there is a promise that the Bible will not let you hang completely clueless. If you read it with the intention to know it, to give it a chance to be in your heart, or to give it a chance to, to fill your mind, it's going to do wonderful things. And maybe that's something that, um, Irina, that you can impart with your husband. This is, um, there are certain questions you simply can't answer until you experience them. Yep. So, so welcome to the entire Bible read through 1 Samuel, <laughs> 17 through 14, or th 24. And uh, thank you for the question, Irene. I'm just making jokes. It was, uh, it is one that we all get asked. So hopefully, our two cents, because actually nobody. I mean, we knows. still. Yeah, the, just so you know, it's not. It's not like we never ponder about these things. By the way, we do all the time. No, I don't. Well, we get together and we we, we oftentimes I, speculate about certain things. I have and, no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> it's so not true. So we continue to ask some of these questions and ponder some of these mysteries. All the time. And 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 science actually reveals some very weird and interesting things in the world of quantum of quantum physics. I think I've mentioned this before and I invite you guys to go look at it and read some of the strange things that are totally out of this world, totally out of our da daily experience that seem, in my mind, point to the absolute physical possibility of the miracles that we read about in the Bible. Boy, ah. So, okay, that's it. Moving on. <clears throat>
Okay, next question. Uh, Fernando Gomez, uh, when Jesus comes back, those who believe in him will be taken up, right? Or is there other stipulations? <laughs> I'll let you feel this one. <laughs> so it's not its not really what you've been hearing in the movies. It's not like, I believe in Jesus, so I get taken up. He doesn't come back to take up what we call rapture, what has been given the name rapture. Uh, the people who get raptured aren't necessarily just people who believe. For there will be many on that day who say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? And they believed. And he will say, take your leave of me. I never knew you. So they're not included in the rapture. Uh, because they're technically not saved, according to what Yeshua said. The, when he comes back, the Bible says that he comes back to call himself unto himself, and that would be the Holy Spirit. And so when you get baptized in his name, uh, it is a, like a wedding ceremony. Like, we are wedded unto Christ, the apostles say, and that we are, we are made one with him as he was one with the Father and he is one with us. And so when he comes back, if, if your soul is not wedded with the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit he gets called like if this is the Holy Spirit this is us because I only have this analogy he calls himself if you're not wedded you don't go with it does that make sense so that's how the rapture thing happens it's the Holy Spirit gets called back to himself and if you're if you have walked with him and had relationship with him and been baptized with him had communion with him and all the things that he commanded you to do because he specifically says those who are my who who will be in me and stay in me and have and the father will stay in them are those who hear my commandments and follow them so he's very clear that it's not just a uh, you know oh I got baptized and then I went out and I sinned for the rest of my life but I got baptized or oh I said I believe in Jesus and I raised my hands and and did the receiving uh, salvation prayer and then I get raptured it, it, it actually doesn't work that way uh, the best way to know for sure what, what, what I'm saying is, is true, which is why we're doing this entire Bible read-through, is to read uh, the, the scriptures yourself. And basically, you could just read everything that's red letter. Uh, and Yeshua is very clear on, on what is required for salvation and, and who will be lifted up on the final day. So that's my, my response to that question. So yeah, but Fernanda, it definitely starts with believing. believing. Yeah. That's the door. That's the gate. Once that gate opens and you walk through it and you continue walking down that path of belief and you learn and you study and you and you pray and you want it more and more every day, you're on the path and he won't let you fall. Yeah, that's what you're asking. He's like, a good shepherd. He won't let you fall. But if you're asking for a list of to check off to make sure that you made it, that's uh, that's not exactly how it works. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Just read the gospel. Don't, don't take what anybody says as as final truth on that not us even not us yeah. yes okay prior um, chapters prior chapters kim canardi uh throw back to samuel sixteen thirteen, and the spirit of the lord came upon david is this the holy spirit i can't recall that we addressed this last week yep same word real real kakodesh it's a, or it's it was or yeah, it's ruach the, ruach but it's of the lord it's right? of I the think. lord yeah so so his spirit can only be holy he's right. holy yeah but he can send other spirits, right? Spirits the bad spirit. from, or yeah, he, yeah, a spirit, a, an evil spirit from the Lord, not an evil spirit of the Lord. Remember, we've read that. Right. I don't know. So. You know, it's a good question you actually ask him because <laughs> the fact that it doesn't actually say Ruach HaKodesh, right? First Samuel 6, 15. Let's, let's take look. a look. Let's take a look. Let's take a gander. I'm wondering. Now you got me all curious this, this, this up on this business 16, 13. Let's see, what words do they use? The Spirit. Ruach of the Lord. Yeah, that's God, it's Jehovah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the Holy Spirit. You can't have Jehovah's Spirit and not be holy, so yes. And the, and the Ruach HaKodesh is the Holy Spirit. If you guys are... A lot of people think the Holy Spirit is this other, de, you know, deity. And it's not... Oh, sorry. Is this what you're saying? No, no. Oh, wait. Sorry. I'm just going to no, press no, button. You, you, tell, you tell me. <laughs> you you keep, keep doing what you're doing. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> keep talking what you're saying. I, I I'm don't done. need to interrupt you. you we got a question. Jill Ray Tom Thompson's got a question. Um, she's, Jill, you're asking if you have to speak in tongues to go to heaven. No. The reason why I say no, and I know that there are going to be people who say, oh, but it's a requirement. <coughs> 
it's listed as one of the things that will be shown. It's t the, the passage that every, every Pentecostal and apostolic quotes when they say you must speak in tongues in order to be saved, which, you know, it, it, what they're, what they're, oh. I love you, Yeshua. Okay. Uh, people like to take a thing and then they like to say like, it must be this or it must be that. But, but in reality, there's only one unforgivable sin, right? And that unforgivable sin is that when the life raft of salvation comes to you, when you hear the word about Yeshua, you hear about the cross and the salvation and the promise, you push it away and say, no, I don't need that. You believe it. You know it's true. You've heard that it is what it is. And you say, no, I don't need that. I don't want that from that God. I don't want to be involved in that. That is the one unforgivable sin. Do you understand? So... So that is what causes damnation, really, like the guarantee of damnation. That's the one unforgivable. You can't undo that one, right? So for, for you to not speak in tongues, but you believe, you walk, and you, you've been baptized, you take communion, you, you bless his sheep, you feed his sheep, you gather his sheep, you testify of him in front of other people, uh, you, you show love and mercy and grace, you forgive those who have harmed you and, and, and done wrong against you, you forgive yourself, and, uh, and yeah, and, and you give your members, your life, your words, your actions over to the Lord, but let's just say for some reason the gift of speaking in tongues wasn't given on to you. For whatever reason, does that mean you're doomed? No. Does that mean you don't have the Holy Ghost? No. How do I know that? Because when Peter said, Lord, you are the Messiah, when he asked him, who does everybody say that I am? And then he says, who do you guys say that I am? And Peter said, well, you're the Messiah. You're the guy. You're the one. And he says, Peter, you did not figure this out. You didn't use your mind and your genius to know this. The Lord revealed it to you. And he says, nobody can come to the Father. Nobody can come to me unless the Father reveals it to him who I am. And the Father, as we just said, is the Holy Spirit. So if you acknowledge that Yeshua is the Messiah who died on the cross and rose again and is your salvation, you cannot ever understand that unless the Holy Spirit revealed it to you, which means, therefore, the Holy Spirit is with you. So you're already off to a good, a good start. Uh, there are other gifts, and I believe everybody will have a chance to speak in tongues that they want. Paul says to pray for it. Paul also says to pray for prophecy. I mean, he says, he says of all the gifts that I hope you will get, he doesn't say, I hope that you speak in tongues. He says, I hope you will prophesy. So uh, why? Because prophecy edifies and strengthens the body and brings believers and, and causes the body to be strong and, and know that it's on the right course or know what course to take. And so again, I hope that, uh, I hope that, that blesses you. That's my two cents. And I know that the, the Pentecostal and Apostolic churches especially actually teach that if you don't speak in tongues, uh, you don't go to heaven. And then they will coach you on, on how to speak in tongues. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. So that's fun times. Hopefully you guys, uh, you guys uh, get blessed by that. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Anything else? Um, thematic? Yeah, thematic. Um, Kim Canardi. Oh, do you have anything to add? No, no oh. that was great. Um, uh, uh, Kim Canardi, uh, confused by the timeline. Uh, Sam 16, 17 through 23. Saul sends message to Jesse to send his son David to play the harp for him. Then Samuel's 1755, uh, Saul asks, who is the father of David like he didn't know him? Seems like you would remember a little about the guy who could calm you down with his harp. Okay, so does anybody else ask this question? Because I don't want to... Um, well, it just... We this this kind of goes into it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so Ruby asked the same thing, right? I'm not seeing that. Oh, okay. No. No. No, I think, I think, uh, Kim, you're picking up on something that I stumbled over to while reading and I was a little confused and, and, uh, we, we had to carefully go over it and go over the translations and, uh, and figure out how basically the, um, um, the King James version is, uh, um, because of the words they used in the translation, it's confusing. It can cause confusion. It's a little wonky. It's a little wonky. Uh, so to answer the question, uh, if you guys read, to basically clear up the whole mess about David, his age, I think we should just nail this, just make it yeah. super easy. Um, there's three little tricks that we found. 
that cause everybody to be super confused. Actually, four. Let's start with the fourth one, the last one that I would have gotten to. Um, the fourth one is Hollywood in America, who creates these cartoons and these movies and things like that. And they actually tell you that David was 15 years old, uh, a small boy, when he slayed Goliath. That's actually not true. Um, so, uh, the thing about him asking his father who his father is, we read it as though he's saying, I don't know who you are, who's your father. But he's literally asking, who's your father? Because if you read what the blessing is or the winnings are for the person who kills Goliath, it's your father doesn't have to pay taxes. Your entire father's house. That means your dad, your mom, your sisters, your brother, nobody has to pay taxes if you kill this guy Goliath. So that's why he asks him, who's your father? Because he doesn't have to pay taxes anymore. Does that make sense? Everybody in the whole family doesn't have to pay taxes anymore. That's why he's asking who his father is, not because he doesn't know him. Uh, the second thing is, is that we know that David wasn't a child because Saul, who's like the tallest guy, remember, in all the land, by shoulder and head. So the tallest person in the land, second to Saul, went up to his shoulders. That means Saul was significantly a bigger man. And David is able to wear Saul's armor. There's no way that Saul would put on armor on a 15-year-old on a boy who basically the armor would weigh him down and literally basically ensure his death. So we know that actually David was quite a large man. That's another thing too. Is when maybe when David was anointed by Sam, Samuel, he was small and the runt of the litter. But by the time that he got to this point where he's killing Goliath, he's obviously not small because there's no way that Saul would put his armor on him. Um, the other thing that we know is, is that, uh, so he's not small. Oh, um, there's also like a congruency thing. Maybe they didn't pick up on it, but we should just nail it while we're yeah, talking. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> okay, so how did he go from being playing harp and then he's back at his dad's and when he goes to be called to play the harp, he's a young man who's considered a warrior. Remember? War, a warrior yes, boy? a man of war. A man of war. That is a horrible translation. Uh, it was not horrible, but it's... It, it's not necessarily accurate. Yeah. When they call him, it ju he, they're actually stating that he is athletic and good shape. I mean, they're strong. Giving, yeah, he's strong because they're giving all the all the positive credentials of the of the boy. So basically, the reason why he lists it is he doesn't only play his harp. He also becomes like his valet. Armor, yeah, his and his, his armor bearer. He carries his stuff. Yeah. And so that's an important thing for the, him to be big and strong because we hear later that he's carrying Saul's stuff around. Like he's his valet, his armor bearer, whatever. Yeah. So so there's all these misconceptions about David and all these kind of weird writings. And if you actually read it again, guys, and, and you just and you slow down and you really take it take it uh you know at a time, you also know that he was with Saul. He went to his father to attend his sheep uh, to check up on him, and it says that. He said that he left Saul, um, and then he's at his father's, and then the Philistines attack. And then his father uh, says, go and be with your brothers who are already at the war and take provisions and feed them and ask them if they need anything else. When he gets there, he's like, what's going on? He gets his first update. Right, So a lot of us think that the way that it reads, because it kind of jumps around, that the war had started, David's a boy, he goes to his father's, then he goes to his brother's, he's still a boy, it, and it's all jumbled yeah. around, and that's just not the case. And, and just the first time where it says, Saul sends messages, in 16, Saul sends messages to, to Jesse to send his son David to play the harp for him, it, it may not necessarily mean that Saul was completely 100% aware oh Jesse yeah. the Bethlehemite yes I know this guy he sends messengers to him so somebody came hey we got this boy he's great he's awesome he's strong he plays the harp you'll love him okay send us okay send for him that's it that was the, the might have been the whole conversation and then the the um, uh, the servants that brought this information to Saul wrote the letter to to David's father. Yeah. So Saul could have done this whole, could have had David in his court for a long time and not known who his father is. Yeah. The other thing is, is he, Saul had a lot of servants, like probably a thousand. Literally, I think there was a scholar that we read. It said he had like thousands of servants, right? So, you know, if you have an employee, if you're, or, or you work with somebody, you may know who they are, but do you know who their parents are? You know, even if they said, oh, it's my mom, Jamie's birthday today. Yeah. Like two years later, do you remember that their mom's name is Jamie? So, uh, yeah, that, right. that, that's another thing that, uh, uh, you know, it's 
there, if you're king and you have thousands of servants, you're not going to remember who everybody's father is. <laughs> and even if the guy plays harp with you every night, you, you know, David's job was to play the harp to put him to sleep and carry his stuff. I don't think that that means that they were uh, they were buddy buddy. Now Jonathan, on the other hand, maybe, but yeah, it's not so Jonathan who's asking. And it was Jonathan recognizes who David, how special David is after he slays Goliath. Right. The, he sees in David the same thing he had in himself. Twenty, I think it was twenty-seven years prior when he ran into battle without fear. He's like, um, we got this because we got Jehovah on our side. That's what? right. And uh, you know, and the other thing to remember, David's like in his early twenties, most likely, and Saul is fifty-seven. Yeah, he's an old man. That's he's, why he calls him a young man. Yeah, he sees lots and lots of people, but he doesn't call him young man. He calls him young servant. Remember? It's not like young boy. Remember the word is different? Yes. So if you actually look at the words again too, if you guys are like, but he says he's a young boy. No, it doesn't actually say that. Youth. So, yeah. yeah. Everybody misconceives the word youth to mean like an actual teenager. Yeah. And he calls him a stripling. A stripling. A stripling. A young man. Yeah. A stripling is not like a teenage boy. It's actually a young man. So as a 57, 60-year-old guy would call like somebody in their early 20s, a stripling actually tells us that he wasn't a boy. And the fact, too, that he was, uh, he, he, he was already aware of military means that he had to have been older, over 20 years old. Yeah. So these are things that, that again, it's, it's the English translation, once again, kind of makes things wonky. Yeah. Anyways, I think hopefully we answered everything. Yeah, My brain is total mush, you guys. I apologize. But that's exactly, <laughs> that's exa we, we had the same thing. We, we spent a couple hours yeah. on this particular moment because we were like, wait, what? And then, I don't know, just, just to throw it out there, the Septuagint, for example, mm. amidst a whole bunch of text from chapter 16 and 17 and 18 mm -hmm. to alleviate this confusion. And then when we read it carefully again, we realized there shouldn't be a confusion. It's just a confusion in, uh, uh, you know, uh, comprehension of what we're reading. Yeah. So anyway. Okay, moving on. Yeah. Um, Kim Canardi is asking, um, Saul shows increasingly erratic behavior while David is just obedient. After two javelin throws aimed at him, being sent out to fight over and over again, promised a wife then not, then given the second daughter... Saul tells his daughter and Jonathan that he wants to kill David. I guess I question why David would stay somewhat obedient to Saul after so much proof of his motives. Well, we get to that question as we continue to yeah. read actually towards the end where David says, I, the Lord has given, me, given you into my hand. If I wanted to kill you, Saul, he gave me the opportunity. And that, that is at the end of these, these passages here. But the thing is, is David understood that even though he didn't like Saul, he was an anointed man of God, which made him holy. Even in his sin, and even in his sinful ways, and even in his murderous ways, because the Lord had put a promise onto Saul and had anointed him, he was therefore the Lord's. And so that's why, if, that's why David refused to kill him or to fight back or to do anything. It is, it is a really intense thing, especially, and I don't want to give it away yet, just for the sake of the video, but uh, just for what Saul does at the end is just, I was thinking about last night laying in bed, truth mm. be told, and, uh, and it like just made my soul so sad mm. what Saul did. It's just yeah. unbelievably like, wow, that's really bad, Saul. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, and we'll get to it, I'm sure. So, anyways... Uh, I don't even uh, until that moment we all have a little bit of a heartache for Saul and what he's going through the the bipolar nature of his thing but when he does what he does it it, it does kind of it's it hurts yeah it's really hard it's really hard anyway um okay first Samuel 17 Rudy Barlon to me chapter 17 is the climax of the whole book of first Samuel oh, hold on mm. she says exactly what you said perhaps it is several merged stories um, we thought we thought we, that we at first glance we thought that too, but when you actually look at the original Hebrew and you look at the words and you see that it's not it's not jumbled like you think it is. I, I we should probably it's, I guess maybe almost we have to do like a video to show you like by going through the words and going through the process like we did. It's actually not jumbled at all. Uh, it it is in sequence. It, yeah. it is actually accurate. And, but we totally know what you're reading. Yeah. And all we can say is that if you spend the time, do this. Spend the time and take your mouse. Can you guys see that? Take your mouse. Oh, you can't. And go over the numbers. And uh, if you go over the numbers and you get the actual, the words that are there, and, and you do it slowly this way, you guys, uh, it, it, will, it will absolutely become very clear 
that it, that it makes it, it, it makes sense. It's the English translation and the, and also the poetry of the English. There's some things that they say in there that are completely like don't even match. And it, it like remember the set thing. Yeah, and it'll be like set oh. forth or something like that. You're like, set, what? By. set by, set by. You're like, what do you mean set by? There's yeah. so many things that were like the Elizabethan language where they would have understood it in the time. When we actually read it in our modern understanding, we're like set by, like, like you put the drink next to the person or you set it like cement. Like, what do you mean set by? It's just yeah. the, the translation is so horrible. And they keep also saying things like, and, and, uh, uh, David carried the head of Goliath, which he brought to Jerusalem. Right, that was another one. That's another one. They said they it several times, Jerusalem. but Jerusalem wasn't even theirs yet. Not yet. So not totally. And uh, David didn't actually, at this point in the story, take the skull to Jerusalem. Mm -mm. He does later. He does later. And they're just referencing, because everybody in, in Israel knows about the skull buried probably at Golgotha. At Golgotha, yeah. Which it means, I think the what the the head of the head of Goliath or the or the skull of the skull giant of the skull or the giant. skull. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's it, it's it's just reference for the reader of the time. Right. Like it, they're little Toledoths, but I, I totally understand, Kim. Like we totally thought the same thing that it was. Yeah. That two it was almost like two together. stories put yeah. together, and ironically. The way that you're thinking, the way that you perceived it, which is how we perceived it at first too, which is why we went to Septuagint, all the pieces that seem to kind of be like a card deck where the other side is like mixed in is exactly what the, the, the Septuagint took out. Yes. And you're like, oh, okay. But in reality, when you read just what the Septuagint has, it actually doesn't make as much sense and it makes David a child. Right. In that, that, and he wasn't a child. It, we know timeline. He, he he wouldn't have been a child at the time of Goliath. So he was. Yeah, uh, all scholars yeah. believe that he was anointed at fifteen. And so that's another thing. It, this Goliath thing didn't happen the next day. It didn't happen a few months later. Right. It happened years later, right. so from the time that he got anointed by Samuel. So exactly important important stuff. But anyways, I just recommend <laughs> that you that you you take a look at the original words with the with the the strong concordance if you're using Esort. It will really really help you. It takes a while, but it, it will really make it clear. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, if you still have questions, if there's like specific things that are tripping you up on this, we welcome you to write to us. We'll we'll try and actually yeah. go through it. Absolutely. There you go. <clears throat> Or um, anybody else can anybody comment else too. Uh, on this video right now if you have uh, any tools or study tools or notes of somebody you found. We found people who had notes, but all their notes kind of were like, they were they were trying to explain it using the English. That was the problem. Yeah. Everybody we found on the internet who was trying to answer this question was explaining it within English language instead of the original language. <coughs> so. When you use eSort, there's... Um, Especially the desktop version, not necessarily the phone, phone version. Phone. And for me on my Mac, it's actually even more beefed up for some reason. Maybe because I paid three bucks for it. I don't know. Yeah, if you, well, if you pay, you can get multiple. You get multiple beef. You get it beefier. Well, the one thing that uh, the concordance lists is what that particular Hebrew word was translated as, and how many times and where. Right. That's on the everybody's. That's on everybody's. Yeah, it's on okay, everybody's. perfect. So. What that'll allow you to do is you'll see the word, and it, in this particular case is translated as, was, for example, armor bearer. And then you look at all the other cases and you'll notice somewhat wildly different things it's translated as. Yeah. And you can kind of begin to piece together and see, did they translate it properly here? Did they not? I'm just using armor bearer as, as an example because I think it was proper. But um, there are other words where you'll be like, they've translated, they called it said by, but they really should have called it uh, inspired or something. Mm -hmm. Which makes a lot more sense to us, right? So, anyway, you, sometimes you're gonna have to go through this detective work because. Uh, and you should, though. Yeah, and you should. Uh, the King James version, even though it's awesome and reliable, because it gives you all of these concordances that you can really dive into. Well, it does if you're using eSword. If you go and buy one, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's true. <laughs> if if you're, you're reading the, yeah. It's the Strong's Concordance in relationship to eSword that, yeah. or yeah. to uh, King James that King allows James. us to do it. And you can yeah. actually buy a physical Strong's Concordance, by the way. Yeah. And then you can just take a look at, at the word and all that jazz. So yeah. yeah. All, all right. right. Moving on. Yeah, so, yeah, I think so. so okay. Hopefully, I have no idea. I'm in, I'm in a total <laughs> fog. I don't even know if I'm making sense today, you guys. You're making sense. I Praise think. the Lord. Only right. by the grace of God do I speak any not nonsense. Okay. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Rudy Barlon. I'm done. Uh, Samuel 17. 
To me, chapter 17 is the climax of the whole book of Samuel. God demonstrated what he told Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Quote, For my power is made perfect in weakness. The boy David, with his puny slingshot, killed a nine-foot-tall, fully-armed champion Goliath. All David had to say was, I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, God, for the battle is the Lord's. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so... I agree with everything you're saying, especially in the in, in the praise report, and you're absolutely right, but he wasn't a puny boy. That is a cartoon misconception, Hollywoodized thing. He wasn't a boy, but his his slingshot could be described as puny. That's what he used to say. Puny slingshot. Oh, puny slingshot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I thought it meant it was puny boy. Sorry. No. Like I, mean, I said. But he wasn't a boy. We yeah. But still, even if he was a full grown, six foot tall, twenty year old, you know, yeah, stud, he's still not ten foot. He's not ten foot tall with a giant sword and massive armor and right. you know, a shield and forget about it. Yeah. Okay. I mean they had a tank. The Philistines brought a tank. And that's why it <laughs> also if you're saying so so here's the reason too why everybody thinks he's a boy. The misconception and the mistranslation of what Saul calls him, saying you are a young man or you're a young boy or young youth, excuse me. Uh, and he says, you are a young youth, and, and this man has been a warrior since his youth. You can't fight him. Um, and then the fact that when, when <coughs> Goliath sees him, he says, who is this young boy who's coming at me, who's all fair and beautiful? And being that David was like super pale skin, gingery, had been basically playing harp, so he was probably very clean. He was wearing nice clothes, and he's carrying a sling. And, you, and, and if, if he was a bigger man, he was still very puny to Goliath. And one thing that I want you guys to remember is every single day for those 40 days, Goliath came out and talked trash like it was a basketball court. Right. You know what I mean? Every single day, he, they came up, they lined up, Goliath came out, and he talked trash like it was a basketball game. So it's it's when he's saying that he's a boy, he's insulting him because he looks young, he looks pretty, and he's smaller than he is. So according to Goliath's size, David is a boy. But the fact that, that Saul put the armor on David shows that he wasn't a small guy. So that's yeah. uh, it's kind of, it's it's kind of a, a thing that like wow what a realization it, it's a totally different thing than what we've been told well, he, about he, David's he certainly could have been age. five five is the point he could have been five eleven five ten but he certainly wasn't like five two right David because I mean the he, armor, I think he had to be at least six feet probably but the armor wasn't like plate mail it was probably chain mail and you can tie it and you can do things point is I think if, if he even they, put his helmet on him though. I mean, yeah. If you put a helmet yeah. on me that was your helmet, yeah. it would cover my eyes. <laughs> Have you, look at his head. Look at this guy's head. Compared I to mine. Am he has double the brain. Liath. He has double the brain I have, you guys. Well, okay. Uh, no, most of that is filler. I got to be honest. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm my sorry. giant head always takes over the show. Where were we? Uh, we were the uh, th th thing. Think fannies. I don't know. Um, there was a question in real time. I wanted to see if. Uh, Renee, Ren no, that wasn't it. That wasn't the question. Mm -mm. Uh, okay, sorry, my brain, my brain, my brain went haywire. I, I right. think my my lack of sleep is contagious to Alex. You guys, I apologize. I thought I saw a question. Okay. Um, Faunus Prince Lu, Samuel 17.4 um, And there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Uh, his height was approximately 13 to 14 feet. Um, no, Faunus, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think, I, if I remember correctly, a cubit was one and a half feet. But if so, you have other measurements, uh, a chart, show us. Yeah, show us. I mean, we're not we're not trying to say that the chart we found or the information we found is only the truth. So exactly, sh send yeah. us that thing because if he was that tall, that's that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I, but I think the charts that we found, he was about almost ten feet tall. Yeah. Which almost. still back then would have been ginormous. Yeah, ten feet's enormous. And uh, he would have been around four hundred pounds. More, probably. More. If he's buff. Yeah, he probably would have been like five, six hundred pounds. But anyway, his height was approximately 13 to 14... F oh, okay. According to special force members, uh, in 2002, USA Special Ops Task Force in Afghanistan had an encounter with a giant living in a cave. The giant of Kandahar is still filed as secret. He was a cannibal, and it took 30 seconds to kill him, which is a long time with modern weapons. 
He weighed 500 kilograms, which is 1,100 pounds, with scarlet red long hair. A two meter rugby player weighs about 120 kilograms. This giant must have been a monster. Yeah, I seen yeah. that. I seen that video uh, on on that guy, on that on the that giant, giant of Kandahar. And there's a, and there's multiple reports from from uh, American soldiers who fought in Afghanistan uh, that say they saw something like that. And Syria, I think, is the other place, right? Is it Afghanistan and Syria? Or? Yeah, it's Afghanistan. So, task force of Afghanistan. Yeah. I guess these giants. Uh, if these are the Nephilim. Yeah, if these are like Nephilim guys, then yeah, that would make sense. Uh, if these giants are the Nephilim and they somehow survived the flood, and they somehow survived actually before the flood, uh, they survived the civil war that was sent upon them. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that means they're immortal, unless they're killed, because they're still around, if it's the same one mm. from those days. Maybe, I wonder, that's a good anyway, question. Is it rabbit hole? Rabbit hole. Uh, Samion Fefita? Simon. S Simon? I don't know. I hope I'm saying your name right. Samuel? Simon? Simon. Uh, did David win against Goliath because God prepared him and trained him before his fight? I think so. I think, well, two things. God gave him favor. I mean, the skill. I saw a whole documentary of, of like, I guess, the world's best sling, like Olympic slinger or something like that. It was like some guy who's famous as being the world's best slinger guy who does that technique. And he was like 24 years old. Actually would have been about the same age that David was. And uh, he sling this rock. And uh, and they did like a whole thing with like a body and the helmet and all that kind of jazz. And the guy was pretty good, but he missed like 9 out of 10 times. Yeah. So for David to get him on like the first shot, I would say that the Lord gave David like an unbelievable skill of slinging. And I believe that he was actually with him when he threw that first rock. Because if he missed, the guy would know like... All right, that's it. I'm coming to get you. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, um, uh, Renee, yeah, I, I, I now see your questions about the Book of Enoch. Why is it not included? Um, there's we've uh, we've talked about the Book of Enoch lots in prior videos, uh, or the reason why it might not be included. Mm -hmm. And um, it, you know, once you get through the Bible, it's an interesting book to read. There's 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 three books. There's Enoch one, two, and three. The second and third one, I believe, are definitely uh, scholars believe are later written much later um, and nobody really believes that the book of Enoch was from the time of Enoch which was before the flood yes so um, it is most likely a you know not a true account or an eyewitness account so it might be an inspired work somebody might have been getting visions I'm not denying it's uh, it's definitely interesting it, it dives into trying to explain Genesis 6 um, but, um, you know, don't rely on it as gospel necessarily or take it with a grain of salt or whatever it is you have to do. There are some discrepancies between it and the Bible. And as we always say in this program, the Bible wins. Okay, moving on. Um, so my two cents on that is, is that read the book of Enoch. And then as you read the Bible, see if there's anything that doesn't match. In my experience, in Alex's experience, we have found that there's something in these non-canon books which were not taken out of the Bible. I, I, I get that sentence probably every day on my Truth Me Free videos. Why, was, why were these books taken out of the Bible? Why did man manipulate the true Bible? Or why, what are the secrets that everybody's taking out of the Bible? The Bible wasn't, there was nothing taken out of the Bible. The Bible that they chose to put together starting at the Council of Nicaea is still the scriptures that we have today. There are basically three to four different types of Bibles in the world, but the Catholic uh, Bible that then got pulled or the scrolls that got stolen from Martin Luther, which became the Reformation, uh, you know, moment, that Bible is the same. It's not, there's no, there's no books that were ever taken out of the Bible uh, because the Bible is not a book that was written by God's people. It's a bunch of scrolls that a bunch of Gentiles got together and said, what scrolls should we use to define the, our faith? And so they acknowledge that they were scrolls or letters to that people wrote to one another. And they said, but there's good information in here. And they put them together. And, and when you read all of them, the, the canon, which is called the Bible, and the non-canon, which are the books outside the Bible that they have, you see that somewhere the outside the Bible ones don't match with the ones inside the Bible. And they also seem to have kind of like just filler information. Whereas everything in the Bible, there's not really any filler it's all points to a very specific 
objective, which is Christ, and who Christ is, and how we're to relate with Christ, and most importantly, also why Christ did what He did and how He did it. So that, that that's all I want to add is that you should read it for yourself, and and you decide. You know, don't take our don't take our word for it. Don't take somebody else's word for it. You should read. You should be knowledgeable, and you should know for yourself what the differences are. We're not giving it to you now in the video because we actually want you to read it. We want you to do the work and and have that knowledge in your head. Nothing is going to be more powerful in your evangelism and your confidence in the in the Bible than if you have the counterweight. Of, of of why something works or doesn't work. If you if you have that knowledge yourself, you can look people directly in the eye and not even you know uh, be shy about it. You could be like, no, I read it, I know. Not because Nathan said, not because Alex said, or not because a theologian said, but because you yourself read it. Amen. Amen. That's that's all. That's my, um, that's my soapbox for the day. Yeah, and Renee, I see your comment about the Book of Enoch, your belief, your theory that the Book of Enoch was preserved by God for the last days, and these are the days. And that the Dead Sea Scrolls contain writings of the Book of Enoch. They do, but the Dead Sea Scrolls are not older than the Flood. They're they're not even older than um, Yeshua's coming. No, they were so, written 150 years after Christ, or 150 yeah. A.D. So yeah. they were technically 120, no, 110 years after Christ died. Yeah. So they are the oldest. Well, Septuagint's older even, and there was another one that we found that's even older. But what was that? Uh. But anyways, it's it was it, the 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 Dead Sea Scrolls are great because are you thinking of the Ar the Aramean one? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. But yeah. we don't we don't know if what they're using is copies or if it's the real deal. Sorry, this is inside conversation. That, yeah. Like this is all, <laughs> our own research, guys. Sorry, but um, uh, what was I saying? Gosh, I'm still out of it today. I don't know, buddy. Let's just move on. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it was important. Probably was. Jennifer Connolly, Samuel. Oh, 17. Oh. Dead Sea Scrolls. The yes. reason why I think the Dead Sea Scrolls are a blessing from God is, is here's what's crazy, is that according to the original Hebrew words that are in the Dead Sea Scroll, in the chapters that, that we have, which is the Old Testament, compared to what we have, like the Strong's Concordance uses, it all matches up. Yes. So that's why it is important, because if you take a look at Strong's Concordance today, which is based off upon the Masoretic, and you say, well, how do we know that the Masoretic, which was written a thousand years after Christ, wasn't manipulated, wasn't you know changed by the Catholics or blah, 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 which is what everybody always argues. The fact is, is that they match perfectly with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they did actually keep it accurate. The only thing that's different is there would be like in Nathan, it, instead of being N-A-T-H-A-N, it would be N-A-T-T-H-A-N. That's literally the only difference. So I, that's, that is an important yeah, thing. Yeah, like I remember specifically looking this up once. The Dead Sea Scrolls have a fully intact book of Leviticus. It matches 100% with the book of Leviticus of the Masoretic text. Exactly. And if you were going to mess with the book, that's the one you want to mess with Leviticus, which is the law. Yeah. So... Because you right. can make that one fit fit to uh, your likings. Exactly. And you shall have a tablet in the future. And you may look at your tablet daily, even on Sabbath day. And watch TV. <laughs> and use satellite dishes. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, Fanus Prince Lou, Samuel 17... Oh, no, we never read that one. Jennifer Connolly, uh, Samuel 17, 4, 5. And there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a full coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. How tall was Goliath? Six cubits in a span. Dead Sea Scrolls says four cubits in a span. Mm. Six nine, possibly. He was mm. wearing copper chain mail and a helmet. Um... What was the weight of the armor in modern terms? The only possible shot was the headshot. God is so amazing. He makes a way when there seems to be no way. Um, interesting that the Dead Sea Scrolls say four cubits in a span because that would be six feet. I'd have to, yeah, we'd have to. How, where'd you find that? Um, I definitely want to take a look at that. We could Google it, but that would be, take time. That would take time. We'll have to take a look at that. And actually, maybe we'll bring that up at the beginning of the next video. Yeah. Very cool. That's a fine. I would be interested in checking that out. Six cubits in a span. We, if a cubit, from, again, from our reading, was one and a half feet. So that would be nine feet. The only thing is, is if he was six, in, six feet, if he was six feet, nine inches, and then you take a look at his spear head weighed 15 pounds. Yeah. And, was a, and it was the equivalent of the rod for the curtain, right? Yeah. 
I mean, 6'9 is a big guy, even if you're super buff, but it wasn't like they had a gym and it wasn't like they had protein powder <laughs> and creatine. You get what I'm trying yeah. to say? So, I like, mean, just moving rocks around every day would make you strong. You, yeah, that's true. That's true. You could um, do that. Uh, he could do pushing on the rock thing, which we find out later. Easter egg. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I'd be interested to see if it changes the size of his other things, though. Of his, like, gear. Yeah. Do you 15, get what I mean? A 15 pound, a 15 pound spearhead? spearhead, that means you toss this bad boy and it will just, it's like, it'll nail. There's no stopping it. Yeah, it'll nail people to anything. I mean, it's going to knock people down. It's th that intense. I would say the average spearhead is at most a pound. Maybe, maybe two, three, like, I don't even know. I mean, that's a heavy spear, man. Have yeah. you ever thrown a spear or like a javelin? No. Like, they're heavy. Yeah. Like, I mean, you would think they're light, you know what I mean? But yeah. if you sit there throwing that thing all day, are you going to be throwing it in battle? Yeah. I don't know. If it's like a real deal made with wood, I don't think it's going to be that light. My point is, is that 15 pound spearhead, yeah. you got to be like, you got to be like Nate strong. And his Just armor, saying, we looked it up, his armor was like 125 pounds armor. Gotta have guns like me. <laughs> 125 pounds was the weight of his armor, so that's really heavy armor. That's if like you're only six foot nine. That's at least which a is third tall. of your weight. Yeah, that would be about a third of your weight in armor. That's a lot. Yeah, I don't know if that's what it says though. I would be really interested. Not that we're doubting you. It's just like I would be. I I, I just think he'd have to be bigger, but who knows? Let's find out. Yeah. Uh, people are asking. Jennifer Connelly says, "Were people shorter back then?" If they had ever been in an old house, things are smaller. Yeah, I would say that people were definitely shorter back then. I mean, people were shorter a hundred years ago, so I don't understand. Yeah, how they so could be. Saul might be six foot tall then, and everybody else is like five foot five. There's a bunch of like four four footers running around. <laughs> hey, listen to us, Saul. We're gonna kill you dead real good. <laughs> okay. They got like chipmunks. We represent. <laughs> no sleep for this guy. Don't you know? Give don't. him a break. Okay. Anything Nathan says does not represent the views of what Nathan says. <laughs> Thomas Prince of Samuel 17.25 um, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The rod or stick, staves, play an important role throughout the Bible. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is so important that God instructed the high priest to put Moses' staff in the temple. The rod represents God authority. But the opposite happens with Yeshua. A stick is put in, the hand, in his hand, Matthew 27.29, and mocked and then beaten with the stick. Yeshua had to lose all authority just to rise again as our champion. Mm. Mm. That's good. It's an interesting point. Also, a staff was a, uh, a testimony. Remember, they would carve their life story on their staff. So if you had taken the staff, you would see hieroglyphs of all the basically the most important moments. So, for instance, when David killed the lion and the bear, that would have been hieroglyphed onto his staff. That's actually how you also know whose staff it is. Not that there was probably a staff that looked the same as anybody else's, but yeah. Chris Mashka says Hebrew translates seven feet. Seven feet. Hmm. Where it, you mean like in the concordance it translates that, or if you can get, tell us where, that'd be interesting to know. Yeah. Okay. Um, mm, where were we? Okay, Rudy Barlon. All the powers of the Philistines fell face down. First their god Dagon fell face down before the Ark of the Lord in 5.3, and now their most powerful warrior fell face down before God's servant David. Boom, bam. Bam. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, everybody falls on their face in front of God. Mm -hmm. um, Faunus Prince of Samuel 17.26, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Bubbing. I think only a few of us who face death can imagine the faith David had on, on Yahweh for our living God. As Yeshua said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed. Sometimes when we face a challenge, we first try to fix it ourselves. Then if it doesn't work, we pray instead of pray and then do. Mm -hmm. That's true, Faunus. We first exhaust our own resources, yep. uh, which is like happens really quickly in most cases. And, yeah. and then we come crying. And David's really good at actually asking the Lord first before he acts. Yeah. In this case, he didn't, though. Did he? No, he, he, he just had the faith. He had the faith. But he was also anointed, so, you know. Yeah, he had the faith. He. Well, the you know, it does say that when... Uh, 
when he got anointed that God was with him. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So. So he really. He was already walking around, and God was with him. Right. Um. So. Above Am. It wasn't necessarily. I guess we could say it wasn't that David was superhuman, and had crazy faith from some genetic, he, you know, gift. He did have a cape. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was that he was already anointed, and the Lord was already with him, which is kind of like him having the Holy Spirit with him. Yeah, so the Holy for sure. The Spirit of God sort of probably took over in that moment a bit and pushed David to have the courage to go and do this thing. The skill, the strength, the hyper-focus? Yeah. Where were we? Sorry, I moved the scrolled thing. We're over here. We're here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Doreen Anderson, uh, 1728 through 29. Looks like David's brother brothers didn't like him. In the NIV version, it says, Eliab thought David to be conceited and had a wicked heart to come down only to watch the battle. David's response was, Now what have I done? Can't I even speak? Looks like David had ongoing issues with his brothers. Yeah. I can relate. <laughs> mm. Is that not why you nudge me? That's why I nudge Oh, him. yeah, yeah. I can relate. Yeah. Yeah. His brothers definitely, uh, he was the runt of the litter, as you've said. And then he was anointed. Yeah, and then he was picked by Samuel. Everybody knows who Samuel is. Who wants their little brother to be king over them? Uh, nobody. Yeah, I mean, it's the story of Joseph. <laughs> yeah, again. exactly. You know, and so the seven brothers were uh, jealous and what have you. The dad didn't even call him when he said, bring me your sons. I yeah. mean, what a kick while you're down already, you know? Right. You're like, gee, yeah. thanks, Pops. Love you, too. But that's another thing, though. David still goes and serves his dad, still takes care of the sheep, checks on him. It's yeah. A good, it's a good son. He is. So for all you children out there who... Don't think you like your parents. Even David liked his dad, who wasn't very nice to him. <laughs> One thing I think I've noticed, if I remember correctly, none of his brothers are with him when he's on his, on the run. Is that right? No, he goes to get his family, remember? Oh, they go with him. Yeah. He goes and gets his family, remember? They go with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. They're right. amongst the 400. Right, because they would be a target for Saul. Yeah, because he's like, they're gonna, he's going to come get you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, But in reality, they probably go with David just because they want to save their own life, not because they love or care for David. Right. I mean, I don't know their hearts, but I'm just saying. Well, they we don't, don't really seem to be too loving to the guy. At that moment, they're not, for sure. David, so blessed to see you. I think you once, the, once he conquers uh, Goliath, everybody changes in how they view David from that point. Yeah, on. well, he did carry the head with him everywhere. <laughs> I know, just to make sure nobody's confused. Could you guys imagine this? I was talking about this. Should I do it? Should I do, do it? it? Could you imagine, according to what the scriptures say here, <laughs> David carried this head thing with him everywhere he went. So he'd just be like, hi, I'm David. Nice to meet you, Casey. So he's like, he's always got the head. And remember, if Goliath is big either way. I mean, you're talking like a bigger head than Alex, guys. <laughs> For Huge sure, head, bigger, right? Bigger, so he's, he's carrying this head everywhere he goes. He probably tied the hair so he could strap it around his shoulder and carry it like a purse because who wants to actually hold it in your hand all day? So he's just got this head chilling. I mean, could you imagine when he goes to meet, like, Saul's daughter? He's like, hey, what's up? He's got a dead man's head just, like, chilling from his side. <laughs> hey, David, put the dead man's head away. We all know you killed Goliath. We get it. <laughs> dead, man's, dead man's head chilling at his side on a first date. I mean, that's... What is that, Versace? No, it's Goliath. <laughs> it's Goliath. Thank you very much. It's Goliath. It's a one of a kind. <coughs> Wow, brilliant! Sorry. All right, we just that that just you know. It does say he carried the head with him everywhere it, he went. It does. Though. It does. And it, thirty it, years later, he's in Jerusalem. He's got the head with this him. Is, you you know, know what I'm saying? This guy's got an issue with this head. We've had we've had the blessing of uh, seeing Mel Brooks movies. Yeah. So our imagination immediately goes to a guy walking around with a head all day. Literally. Long. Yeah. All right. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> excuse me. I mean, no wonder everybody liked him. He walked into town. He's carrying a head. Yeah. No wonder, the, be nice no wonder the song said, uh, He killed 10,000 men. <laughs> <laughs> Saul's just like, Why are they singing, He killed 10,000? I killed 1,000. He killed one guy. They're like, eh, He's carrying around a head. Yeah. You're not carrying around a head, head Saul. Jeez. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you carried around a head or some guts or something, we'd, we'd crank up your death toll, oh, too. Wow. Just saying, I would. Endless comedy here. Sorry, I'm just saying, I um, would. Yeah. 
I've lost my train of thought. I don't think I had a thought. We actually. don't have to. Everybody else is on on you track. Guys, they thank wrote, God they for wrote you guys. comments. Yeah, we don't have God. to be on, on. We don't. We don't. We need a script, and you guys are providing it. Thank God. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Dorian Anderson, seventeen twenty-eight through twenty-nine. Looks like David's brothers didn't. Oh, we read that one. Okay, I'm sorry. Rudy Barlin, Goliath's Achilles' heel is his forehead. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> Apparently, not a whole lot going on up there. I guess. Mm -mm. Uh, Jennifer Connolly, First Samuel, seventeen thirty-two. And David said to Saul, "Let no man's heart fail because of him. Mm -hmm. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine." Bam. Now, Deuteronomy twenty one through four. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for thy Lord thy God is with thee, bam, bam. which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priests shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto, the, unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Has anybody in this group gone to battle and used these scriptures? I know I have. Wow. You're in the fight of your life and all odds are against you and you quote these scriptures and have victory by God's hand. Amazing. Being Jennifer, that's what I'm talking about. Jennifer, I mean, woo! I don't know, I think you get a Brian Kranz one. That's, that was just, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. Well done, well played, good, good scripture pull there. Well, Jennifer, uh, it sounds like it sounds like you got a testimony. I got to mm -hmm. be honest with you. I think somebody's going to be if posting you're quoting on, uh, that battle that that battle cry, and and you have victory. You got a testimony, <laughs> and I think I think we might want to read that someday. Can you do a good battle cry? Like Klingon? I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to embarrass myself. You always right go now. Star Trek. What? Well, I'm thinking Bible. You're going Star Trek. Well, I don't. What it's about? Nanu, it's about Nanu, this guy over what? here. <laughs> nanu, Nanu. That's my battle card. Nanu, Nanu. <laughs> okay. That would actually scare me a lot if you did that. <laughs> I just scared myself. Sharon Louis Roberts, Samuel 17, 35 through, uh, 34, 35. David said to Saul, Your servant was a shepherd for my father's flock, and the lion came and the bear, hmm. and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I took hold of his beard, struck him, and killed him. This passage reminded me of Yeshua, our shepherd who rescues us, his lambs, from Satan who is trying to take us away from him, but he grabs us back. Bam. Exactly. Word. Wait, is Yeshua in scripture again? Yeah. <sighs> Just. Well, you know, it's, you know, reading this carefully, reading the accounts, the, the, the stories of starting here with David carefully. I'm struck by how special and anointed David is and how many things that he does that do point towards what Yeshua does fully later. Yeah. Um, David's actually pretty amazing. David's pretty I mean, awesome. I can understand why the Jews love Moses and David so much. Yeah. Because they're both just kind of like... Pretty awesome. They're kind of just like... You know what I mean? Yeah, like mic drop all day. They're like they're like not a minion though, but they're like kingly mic drops. You yeah, know? They're, they're royal mic drops yeah. for sure. It's amazing. Um... Angie Brown, uh, Samuel seventeen thirty seven. The Lord saved me from the lion and the bear. He will also save me from this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. A lot of what I'm getting from these passages is obey the Lord, trust in him, and he will take care of you. I think also another thing to get, I totally agree with you, Gail, but I think the other thing is too is that God prepares us. You know, had David complained about being a shepherd out there in the wilderness all that time and thought, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm better than this. I deserve to be in the palace. I, I'm going to be king one day, and I deserve to be in a soft, fluffy feather pillow bed and, and with somebody feeding me grapes and fanning me with palms. You get what I'm trying to say? Stop like describing my life. Yeah, I know. So then the next thing is, you, would not, you wouldn't have this guy who's so confident to defeat this guy. Yeah. And... And it's like so many of us take a look at our situation and go, why do you hate me, God? I mean, I've obviously never done that in the last 24 hours. But <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Like, we, we have to understand that God knows, we, like, truly. It's not just a thing that we should say. Like, we need to understand. God has us right where we are meant to be because it plays a role. Whether we're suffering, whether we're struggling... I mean, I wouldn't be who I am today without any of my issues, the homelessness, the heart issues, the kidney stone. 
I, I wouldn't be, you know, any of the things that I'm dealing with. I wouldn't be who I am without those things. So that's why I think, too, later on when the apostles are really trying to teach us and they say they rejoice in their sufferings, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a thing that I think we just so easily read and then we get in our sufferings and we're like, yeah, but Job had like double the wealth. You know, we always right. go like, like when we're suffering, we just keep going to the, the eyes of the prize of the, of the fluffiness that we want instead yeah. of being like, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to get stoned. Thank you, Lord, for allowing my ship to get wrecked. And thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be in prison. Like, for your namesake. For your namesake, yeah. Yeah. I, and I think a lot of us, my final thing, my final thing, swear, swear on this. I think that the thing is, is a lot of us, let's say that our friend, our neighbor, our loved one hates us because I have something that has nothing to do with the gospel, right? Like the word gospel doesn't come in. They're not like, you love Jesus, so I'm going to put you in jail. You love Jesus, so I'm going to take your wealth. Like it's almost like if somebody did that, we would be like, oh, awesome. Righteous treasures. Hello. Yeah. Beat me. Throw me in jail. You know, take my house. Do whatever, right? Maybe we wouldn't, but we're supposed to. But the thing is, is that if you are in Christ, all that happens to you is for Christ. So that's the thing that we, we have to like, we have to connect the two. It may not look like the reason we're getting attacked is because of Christ, especially for those of us here in America. Like nobody's knocking on our door and being like, we hear you love Jesus. You're going to jail. Like, but the things that we do suffer and the things that do come against us and the struggles we do indeed have that hurt our flesh and our mind, these things are happening to us because we're fighting spirit realm we're fighting principalities we're not fighting flesh and bone it's these things aren't happening to us because of flesh and bone or, or the situation that it looks like it's happening to us because within that there's a preparation for our goliath that we're going to destroy in yeshua's name amen just prophesying okay i'm done that's awesome no it's a good it's a good point i think you should i think you should kind of deserve a mic drop on that i can't mic drop myself we've talked about this in the past sorry Oh, I get a real mic drop, old school style. Oh, old school style. I don't have the controls to do your fancy video mic drops. I want the Superman kid. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The struggles every day that we may experience, the difficulties in our lives, though it is not does not seem outwardly as persecution for your belief in Christ. Um, it is it, it is persecution nonetheless. It is strengthening in Christ. Yeah. It may not be persecution for your faith in Christ, but it is your strengthening for your blessings. It is Christ. the lion and the bear that came against David. <laughs> exactly. What well, did they come against they him didn't because come of against Christ? Him because, because yeah, because he loves the bear's Jehovah. like, oh, you like Jehovah? I'm gonna eat your sheep, David. He's okay. like, no. He came because David's like, oh, this is gonna prepare me one day for I kill a really big man with a big ego. Yeah. That's me slinging a sling. I got gotcha. you. Okay. I figured that out. I didn't want you guys thinking I was partying over here or something. No, no, I, I figured it was a sling. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, we're here, right? No. No? Uh, we're here. I just like to point at one. Kim Canardi, Samuel 1740. Is there significance to five stones? David tries out the trappings of Saul's army, realizes he only needs what he's always used to protect his flock, what, what is familiar. This is so bold. Just as Yeshua and his disciples learned, came with no trappings but faith faith that needs will be met bam word um kim continues samuel seventeen forty five. where did david get his courage and the words for his prophetic decree did david know what the anointing from samuel meant i think so well, i imagine samuel he, would teach him what it means and he felt it that's really yeah, what it that's is that's true he probably felt he, it he felt it by the way the five stones i i don't know i can't think of I can't think of five stones anywhere else. I can think of 12 stones, but I can't think of symbolic of five stones. Five, number of grace. Oh, okay. CJ. CJ Richter says five is the number of grace. There hmm. you go. That's cool. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I receive that. Um, I, need, I need five stones of grace on me all the time. Yeah. Especially when I get no sleep. <laughs> okay. Um, Gail McKnight, uh, Samuel, First uh, Samuel forty-five, or probably yeah. seventeen forty-five, right? Uh, then said David to the Philistine, "Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to thee in the name of Jehovah of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, 
whom thou hast defied. This day will Jehovah deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from off thee. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day unto the birds of the heavens and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, mm -hmm. and that all the assembly may know that Jehovah saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is Jehovah's, and he will give you into, into our hand. I love this, David. I love this. David had great faith and gave God the glory and trusted in him. And uh, we agree. I agree. Linda, Linda says, Gail, uh, don't, j don't you just wonder what his brother thought after just getting upset with him for coming to see the battle and then David defeats their enemy with a small stone? Love it. <laughs> yeah. His brother is probably picking off his jaw from the floor, you know? Or kicking a stone, being like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Lord, ultimately. why do you keep blessing my brother? Probably. He's he not was, even as handsome as I am. He's probably happy for him in the end. I mean, not like that ever happened to me or anything. Is it? Go ahead. Hmm? Nothing. Okay. Where All right. This one? Yeah. Samuel yeah. Um, uh, 18. Rudy Barlon. Jealousy poisoned the mind of Saul that killing David became his life's goal. Wait, wait. Uh, in, in 18, 6 through 9. Yeah. Jealousy poisoned the mind of wait, Saul. Wait, did you says. read this? Yes. Yeah, that was part of that. Oh. That did not need to be uh, there. That's why it was together, because it was a comment on that one. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> um, That's true. Ru Ruby. Rudy. That's very true. Yeah. Um, do we have any questions here real time? No. Okay. Um, Faunus. Samuel 8. Or probably 18 right yeah and it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied in the midst of the house and David played with his hand as at other times and there was a javelin in Saul's hand how many times have you heard people ask why Jehovah let evil things happen on earth as with Saul we never look at ourselves and say it is the choices man made that started and continue to make for the evil in this world exactly yeah Saul set his heart Mm -hmm. upon hurting or he was angry and jealous at David um, he wasn't rejoicing in David's victory but in reality Saul was mad at himself because he had made a mistake and it cost him his kingship and it cost him his bloodline to have the kingship and he's just mad he's just bitter yeah you know he's like a, a just a bitter old man and when in and, and when he saw somebody else was blessed and happy and had what he was supposed to have it just made him jealous yeah, and then he just wants to take it out and kill everybody, you know. Yep, that's it. And and how many of us are honestly the same? I mean, uh, how many of us are are there where we're we're like, well, why are they blessed? Why do they have this? How come I don't? What you know? Well, if they have it, then I want to break it, or I want to take it, or I want to ruin their fun of it. There are people who are vindictive, right? So where am I? Yeah, going? yeah, they're vindictive like that. So it just it. I think the thing that we were talking about. This is very short. A thing that we were talking about over this last read this week, you guys, or last two weeks, but was in reality, how many of us can actually relate more to Saul than to David? I mean, really, how many of us are polar? How many of us are stepping in sin one moment and then totally loving God the next and being like, oh, why do I do that? Or, oh, I know it's wrong, but I just, I, I, my flesh is so irked or my anger is so fueled or, and then we just, we act out of our flesh for a moment and we get all hot headed and then we go back and we're just like, oh, Lord, forgive me. And it breaks our heart what we do. And then, you know, hopefully the Lord will allow us to come back. And, and walk righteously with him, but hopefully we will. At the end of this, Saul doesn't. You know what I mean? Saul gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And I think that's the other thing too is a message from Saul that would, should bless us all is that if we allow it to enter into our hearts and stay there and we don't purge it, it will consume us. Just yeah. like what happened with Cain and Abel. He says, this thing is at the door. It is a beast that wants to devour you. And if you do not contain it, if you do not control it, it will devour you. And it didn't only devour him, but it devoured his brother. And uh, I don't know. I just think that like too often, especially us in the past, where we've confessed this, so I'm not throwing you under the bus here with me, but we've too easily judged the people who are in these scriptures here in, this, in these passages about how could they be like that? Or why would they do this? What's wrong with them? But, you know how many of us are in our own version of these things doing it as well today, right? Yep, and, and 
you know, we see the difference between how, um, you know, David's on the run and his life ain't ain't happy. He's in a cave this whole time. And uh, when given the opportunity to end it and, and reign over his enemy, David has compassion on Saul and he says, I can't kill this man. I, I loved him once yeah. and, and he's the anointed of God. I'm not going to do this. Right. And um, and he had no problem taking down Goliath. It's not like he's not a not a warrior. Yeah, he could take in Saul, no problem. He does. He cuts the the, the coat. He, yeah, yeah. And and what my point is, like David wasn't just like I can't just kill anyone. No, David killed Goliath and chopped off his head without thinking twice about it. And he killed the guys who he needed the foreskins of. That right, was like no problem. That's right. So like when when it's good for him to kill, he's really really good at it. Right. So it's not like he's worried that he's not going to be able exactly. to succeed, especially when he cuts to him or, and he or proves to him, I or, could have killed you that night. Or it's like one of those things where he's never killed before, so now he's having trouble even doing the first time. Yeah. Like uh, a lot of people at war have that issue in the, the very first time. Right. Um, anyway, anyway, this isn't his issue. This isn't his issue. Um, Els is saying, was it, was it not that every time Saul attacked David that before that an evil spirit comes to Saul? First, an evil spirit attacks Saul, and then Saul attack, attacks David. Is it possible that Saul not attack David without that evil spirit? It's a very good question, I think. It's a very good point. Uh, what happens in that moment where Saul goes from, here's a guy who means me no harm and he loves me, to I want him to die? What, what, what does he hear in his mind? That's the thing is, it's not like he's just sitting there looking at the sunset and then all of a sudden, like, out of the blue, a switch goes and he's like, must kill David, must kill, da you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what happens is, is he hears the people singing and they're giving David more credit than him. Or David is getting the blessing and he's winning these victories and he's being blessed. And he, so it's a, re his negative spirit that comes to him, I think, is always rooted to evil, which is always rooted to pride. But is always rooted to greed or, or jealousy, which right. is always rooted to pride. And uh, and so that's a, I think the evil spirit comes when we make a doorway for it to come into. Right. That's, right. All, that's my point of my, so, all my words. So Saul, no, that's very true. Saul doesn't act, in, when he hears that, that song he doesn't like, he doesn't immediately grab a spear and try to kill David in the moment. Right. He gets hurt by it. He gets angry with it. He buries it. But he's, but and the Lord knows, and, and it stews, and the Lord knows his heart. Mm -hmm. He just, the Lord kind of just, you know, sends the evil spirit, and the evil spirit gives him the courage, or the, 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 the like, the psych, the psych, the, the psychopathy, the psychoticness, that's not a word, to try and kill David right then and there. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like a trigger, I don't yeah. think, immediately. It's a thing that, like, festers, and yeah. he can't control it. Yeah. And it's his own inner dialogue, which whether it's the demon or the, the, the evil spirit that's like festering that whisper in his ear. Are you going to allow that to happen? Are you going to allow him to be praised? Are you going to allow him to take over your kingdom? No, you're right. That's not a good idea. No, I don't want him to take over. I know I'm going to kill him. You know? Yeah, exactly. And he loses his mind. That's it. Okay. Um, where were we? I have no idea. You're <laughs> That's your job. You're driving this thing. I'm just oh I'm just in the driver or the passenger seat. I'm driving. I'm riding, in the driver's seat. I'm in, I'm sh I'm riding shotgun. I don't think this was a co uh, April Angelus. I don't think this was a coincidence that Samuel 18:10 that the bad spirit evil spirit came after Saul looked on David with envy. It came the next day. Mm -hmm. Bam. Bam. So, as Yeshua says later at some point, just looking at someone with sin in your mind is already sin. So, and you know what I, you know of which I speak. So, is it is it I manifest? Don't. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, seriously, what are you talking about? You know the Sermon on the Mount. He says. Oh, I thought you said there was like something that you were hinting about the Sermon on the Mount, though. Like, well, no, he says that you know you don't have to go through with the act if you look upon someone yeah, yeah. with lust, you've already sinned. I know, but when you said you know what I mean, I thought you meant like. Oh, that's what I mean. And so in this case, April, you're pointing out that um, Saul looked upon David with envy. Yeah. That was the sin. And then the result of that, he was given over to it. Right. In the next day with the evil spirit. Oh. Breaks my heart. Yeah. All he needed was a hug. He yeah. just he just needed some hugs. Yeah, yeah. Well. Saul needed hugs, guys. I, 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 I If don't you know. see a Saul, give him a hug. If he has a spear, run. <laughs> Good advice. All right. Oh, the wisdom. The wisdom. The wisdom, wisdom of Solomon. Out of you. 
Oh, double portion, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> um, vice versa, Samuel eighteen twenty one. How was Saul's daughter a snare unto David? Was she? Let's take a look. No, he wanted her to be a snare unto David. Yeah, I believe that's But what. she wasn't. Oh, here, so you guys can read with this. And Saul said, I will give him her that she may be a snare to him. Yeah, he wants her to be a snare. He wants to trap David with her, but she wasn't actually a trap. She actually saved him. Yeah. So that was just his desire, not what actually was. Mm -hmm. Good question. Found his Prince Lou, 1825. And Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. Excuse me. I could see him going, can I just get him gold? <laughs> <laughs> those who were not, uh, those who were not, those who were not, were, okay, those who were not circumcised were to cut off, were to be cut off from the people. Genesis 17, 10 through 14. This includes the slaves mm -hmm. and Gentiles. David had to kill them to get the foreskin, and some would say it was an evil spirit in Saul that made the request, meaning of 100 in Hebrew. Eye of the needle, Yeshua said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. 200 meaning is emerging head or insufficient. All the things 200 foreskin in the world won't get you in heaven but your faith in Yeshua. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it doesn't matter all the things that you collect. So, but this was a dowry. I don't know. No, no. I get what you're saying. Well, he was actually hoping that David would get killed in the adventure. Yeah. Plus, so, the other thing is, is I mean, getting the foreskin, that's just an unpleasant activity. Yeah, that, that takes some devoted servant. Hopefully, David had some really good servants that he didn't even have to do it. He just, like, told his I bet people. You, I bet you David did it himself. Probably. I bet you he did. I bet you did, too. So glad that I don't live in a world where anybody's telling me to go get men's foreskin and deliver it to them in a basket. <laughs> for sure. Right? That is for sure. That's a gnarly, gnarly moment. Yeah. But again, Saul said this in the hopes that David would get killed while trying. Yeah. Um, he probably even said it offhandedly, potentially, as kind of like a, like a cruel joke. Like, okay, yeah, I want something from this guy. Go get me some foreskins of the Philistines. You know what I mean? It's a weird request. That's all I gotta it's say. It's a strange request. He definitely had demons in him. Yeah. He's definitely suffering. But, but you gotta remember that even though it sounds totally weird to us, it makes sense. It it, it well it makes sense, but to them, um, you know, they've just seen the demonstration of the Lord's power. David certainly has. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they've got Samuel around still. Right. So if they need somebody to confirm that the Lord exists and does crazy things, mm -hmm. crazy miracles, they would have someone. And if they read the scriptures, they would learn from uh, how serious it was, the circumcision and all of that. So, um, you know, they, their marking of themselves in the circumcision was like, you know, like what we believe, I guess our equivalent of uh, a baptism, our equivalent of right. a communion, our equivalent of whatever we can ceremonially in some way do to know our in our hearts that the Lord is with us. And to them it was it was the circumcision. So what you're trying to say is circumcision wasn't as weird as it we're we're thinking it to yes. be. Yes. Circumcision to them was like a holy act, like a like a thing that you must do so that the Lord's blessing will be upon you. If you don't do it it won't be upon you. And we looked remember we uh, read this when Moses when his son was actually uncircumcised the Lord was not happy with him about it. Right. So, um, well, it was the first time he commanded him to be circumcised, though. No, he commanded Abraham. Right. Oh, yeah, I know. And Moses what later on was married to one of the Midianites, right. and their son wasn't circumcised. Right. And so, at that time, in order to be in the congregation and be in the spiritual blessing of of God, you had to be circumcised. If you entered into the congregation. Not from a babe, but like from, you know, you were a grown person. You still had to be circumcised. So, it you know, it was a serious thing. You're trying to say it's common. That cutting off a man's tip is just very common. I, I'm trying people. to say it's common. I'm trying to say it's important. I'm trying to say it's... So, are you, so I, I'm trying to understand you, and I'm sure everybody else is. Are you saying that Saul is being holy in this moment, asking for I'm this? I'm not saying Saul is being holy. I'm not saying Saul is being holy. 
I'm saying that the request just sounds to our ears much weirder than it would necessarily in that moment to them. And if the request came, what I'm saying is David didn't go, what? He said, what? Really? Like he wants me to go do that? David probably took it as the king of Israel has spoken and has said this. Mm -hmm. It's very possible that this was like a commandment from God almost. Do you know what I'm saying? I kind of do, but I think he does react like this kind of weird. I don't think so. Oh, now it says it please, David. Yeah. Well be to the king, son of the law, and the days were not inspired. Yeah. yeah. Okay. David's like, okay, cool. I'll go do that. He's like, I can do that because I'm not rich and I can kill. No problem. Yeah. All right. Good deal. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, still, all right. Still weird to me. Well, it's weird to us for sure. Uh, Kim Canardi, Samuel 1827. Um, are the Aham tokens from the conquered Philistines proof of the number slain? Or were they enslaved? Any significance of the particular part? Easy to carry. <laughs> didn't injure. Uh, didn't injure their usefulness as workers. Does this mean the Philistines became part of the family? No, no, no. I believe he actually killed them in battle. Then did it. And then did it. Yeah. And brought it as like a like a like a scalp. Like you bring a scalp if you're a native. I think uh, it does. I think it did two things. I do. I do think that there was a, a symbolism to it. To a, a answer your question, the symbolism is, of course, the commandment from God to be circumcised to separate yourselves. The other thing is, is if you think about it, we we kind of had joked about this. Okay, I had joked about this, but if you think about it too, eventually all the Philistines start running from David. And if you think about it too, if you think if they kill me, they're going to cut my circumcise me, right? My dead body. I don't, I, w I don't mind dying if I'm a soldier kind of thing. Maybe you do, but you really, really mind dying if you think you're going to lose a little piece of yourself. You get what I mean? Because they believe they to go into their afterlife with that piece missing. Right. Yeah. Or not, or, 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 or deformed. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that, that, that would be, it'd be shameful for somebody who's not a Jew. It yeah. wouldn't be like an honor to be like, and I died and they circumcised me and yes, I'm a great right. warrior. Right, right, right. It'd be just the opposite. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> It, it would be it would be uh, humiliating. It is kind of a it, it is kind of a psychological blow to the Philistines. It's a weird thing to do to somebody, man. Like even back then, especially like like who don't maybe they they knew it, but they were just like, oh, these Jews are crazy, you know. But uh, being if you know you're going to get killed and they're going to do something weird with your body, it adds a little bit of like, eh, I don't want to be killed that way, <laughs> you know. Run, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, That's why I think the symbolism of it is. Yeah, it, it, it both honors and defines and hey, remember who we are, right? Yeah. Remember who we are. We're gonna. This is who we are. We're the circumcised. You're not. Right. Right. So we win. Yeah. And then the other part is it freaks them out and makes them run from David. And right. fear the fear of the Lord is wisdom, right? The beginning right. of wisdom. So right. them fearing David is the beginning of them actually being wise. Stay away. I won't kill you if you don't come and attack us. Right. So I think I think it's a double a double whammy is what I'm saying. Makes sense. I hope so. <laughs> Samuel 19, Doreen Anderson, 6 through 10. Saul took an oath that David would not be put to death. When David played the harp, it seemed Saul, it calmed Saul, but the evil spirit still took control, and Saul threw a spear at David. What are we to learn from this? I'm wondering if there's some deep spiritual meaning. Seems like the classic good against evil, but evil prevails? Question mark. Well, evil didn't prevail. It just sustained for a while. David won in the end. Yeah, so, uh, it would, evil wouldn't prevail. But I know what you mean. The symbolism of it is is that to me, it's it, it, this is to me. It, the symbolism of it is is it doesn't matter what fluffiness in life you add. That's what I'm going to use, right? The music would be symbolic of fluffiness. It doesn't matter what you coat your life with. It doesn't matter what what boundaries or or comforts you put yourself into. It doesn't necessarily bring you closer to God. What brings you closer to God is if Saul had gone into his heart and genuinely repented. If we remember the moment where he fell from grace, he didn't repent. Not right. really. No. He fought Samuel. Yeah. He said, well, I, I, I didn't really do that. It was just that we did this. And he goes, did the God tell you to? He's like, well, he didn't say for me not to not to do this. Like he had no repentive heart. And it seems to me that that's really what the sin was is he actually never really repented. You get what I mean? Yeah. So so I think that we can surround ourselves in a bubble, but that bubble won't protect us from our walking right with God. 
and the music to me is a bubble the palace is a bubble the servants and the armies around us is a bubble yeah so that's what I perceive from it I like that I'm also sleepwalking so no I like that I mean <laughs> uh, Doreen uh, is, I love the I love the I love the sentence. I'm wondering if there's some deep spiritual meaning. I think <laughs> I think almost every verse, uh, every verse of the Bible is probably uh, guilty of that, isn't it? But in this case, um, yeah, I think what you're saying is true. The the whatever whatever Saul used to dis just to just to reiterate what you're saying and now in my words I guess whatever Saul used to distract himself which was the music and of course all of the trappings of being king that was never enough to actually make the evil stop right and he never turned or he to make him happy or to make him happy and he never turned he never repented he never actually had a moment where he realized that not only is he not only did he mess up it when he was younger but he has continued in pride and continued to hold on to, uh, well, he just continued in pride. Yeah. That's what he's done. Anyway. Sad. Sad. It Very is sad. sad. Uh, Sharon Roberts, Samuel 19, 12 through 13. So Michal let David down through a window and he went and fled to safety. Michal took an idol and laid it in the bed and put a braided goat hair pillow for its head and covered it with clothes. Not sure why they have an idol in the house. Um, it doesn't say it's idol not, in the King James. Yeah, that's a, that's a bad interpretation again. Idol yeah. is a bad interpretation. They don't have an idol. It, it, what he's saying is, is it's an image. The word idol means image of. So they would create a doll, like a dummy head of David. That's what it was. Yeah. But, but you're right. It's a good call on the idol, but that, that, that's a bad translation. Yeah. Even though it did serve a purpose, but it still sounded odd. It seemed to be... Uh, a common theme for teraphim or household idols. These images were used as talismans to bring a blessing upon the household. This is also a common theme throughout the world today, where someone could have a Buddha statue in the garden to having a Nazar Bunkugu, blue evil eye, which is wildly dis widely displayed in homes, mainly in Turkey. Mm. Yeah, so all the pagan stuff still is alive and well today. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I just think that that translation that you're looking at is, is not accurate. They did, I, I, I remember when we were reading that, the, uh, we didn't say idol for, for yeah, the original. Yeah, it didn't say idol. Just said image. Yeah. Vice versa, uh, Samuel 19.24. What is prophesying, and why is Saul able to do it if he was doing evil by wanting David dead? I thought only good guys can do that. No. 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 That's actually a funny thing because that's what Christianity teaches. Christianity teaches that only people who walk with God can actually have God's powers. That only people who, who believe in Jesus and read the Bible and wake up every day and, and are good boys and good girls are the only ones that God gives power to or spiritual gifting to. And that's just not the case. Um, there's times in the Bible where God actually uses other seers. I mean, we learn from... from the Egyptian situation where they threw their staffs and they turned into snakes. They, they did do magic. They did do real, actual magic. Uh, there was a, the seer that said if the cow and the, and the cart goes to the left, it's this. If the cow and the cart goes to the right, it's this. And then it proved that it was of God and it proved that the seer was seen correctly. So um, it's, a, it's an unfortunate teachings in Christianity that like anybody who who is hearing something is is not hearing of of god but god can use can not always but can use uh anybody to to fulfill god's will um so i, I think that is very important to to be aware of but how do you know if anybody is hearing from god or a false spirit is you have to you have to match it against scripture that's that's how you would know that's the only way to know so uh even non-believers I've heard speak and they have actually quoted scripture when they said I just have the feeling that and then they'll say something and they're literally speaking scripture right and you're like yeah that's not taught in the churches and that's really crazy that you're speaking literally scripture and right. then you show them where it says that in the Bible and they're like wow I've always just felt that way hmm. it happens quite a bit so I mean I heard God my whole life before I became a believer it's not like all of a sudden the voice changed. It was like, Nathan, I'm God. 
<laughs> you know, like it was devilly sounding. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I believe in Jesus. And it was like, Nathan, <laughs> I'm God. You know what I'm saying? You're in rare form today. I love it. Well, that's what happens when you don't give me sleep. My, not my fault. But does that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. Um, I remember this part when Saul was prophesying again after all the drama and all of the I want to kill David stuff. This was before he actually went and, you know, destroyed an entire city. But um, it was one of those moments where you're like, come on, Saul. You're so close to God. He's giving you the gifts of the Spirit. Just repent, man. This this bipolar thing he had going on. Yeah. First, he'd forgive David and realize that he he should he's evil and he shouldn't be doing it. But then he'd go back to it. He could never just give it up. And just because you are demonstrating the gifts of the Spirit doesn't necessarily mean that you are you are in relationship with God. Even even Yeshua says that there will be many who prophesy in my name, perform miracles in my name, and I will say, take your leave of me. I never knew you. Hmm. Now, I'm not speaking that over Saul. I believe that God has a special grace for Saul for whatever, you know, it's not our place to judge him. Only God judges, right? right? But it, he does say that performing miracles, prophesying in his name isn't even a sign of salvation. It's not a sign of him you even having a relationship with him. Right. Not. I mean, you can have a relationship with somebody and it's a bad one. Christ is saying, you can have my powers, you can have my gifts, you can act in, in spirit realm uh, activities, let's say, right? Uh, it's not the sentence I was really looking for, but you guys get what I'm saying. Yeah. And he can say, I'm, I don't even know who you are. So that's the thing, is, is, is the, the will of God will use anybody for the overall arc of the story of humanity, right? right? But that doesn't mean that the people that got used are right with God. Yeah. And, you know, in, in giving Saul those moments of prophecy... Um, Just shows he was with him at one point. He was with him for sure. Right at the beginning when Saul was uh, anointed and crowned, he was with him. Yeah. And, and Saul didn't do well enough, I should say, I guess is the point. He didn't do well enough with that. He's he didn't a- respond well. He was a little eager. Yeah. He, he so sad. It's super sad. And then it just kept building on itself. It was all downhill from there. It kind of just went building on itself. Okay. Um, Samuel, yep, 20. Um, uh, uh, Samuel twenty thirty. What does Saul mean when he asked Jonathan if he was unto the confusion of his mother's nakedness? Oh, yeah. So uh, we did a little research on this and... Uh, to uh, to insult your mother was the worst thing you could do back then. It was like the greatest of insults, and to uh, to see your mother's nakedness or mock your mother's nakedness was like the most shameful thing you could do to the family. And so that's he's saying that you're so confused. That you're harming the family, like you're on the wrong team, buddy. You're you're rooting for the wrong team. That what you're doing is so bad, it's equivalent of seeing your mother's nakedness or shaming your mother. That's that's what it meant. Yeah. Took a little took a little research for us to find that out as well. So good question. Uh, vice versa. Twenty forty one. Uh, was it normal for men to kiss each other back then? I have a lot of good friends, but never wanted to kiss them. Yes, it is. They still do it today, actually. Yeah. Certain cultures, uh, it's a kiss on the cheek, or it's two kisses on the cheek, mm-hmm. one, one. The Russians did it in the Soviet Union. They still do it. They still do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, too, is like in the Middle East, even to this day, men walk holding hands. But they won't hold hands with like women casually, but they will hold hands and walk with each other. You mean like Isla- in, in Islamic uh-huh. countries? Yeah. Yeah, they will walk and hold hands like it's nothing. Like it's a normal thing, and they'll cuddle, like, and it's totally normal. True story. Wow. Yeah. So, it's just a thing. It's a cultural thing. Yeah, our Western world, we're we're bred to be like, like I mean, Alex touches me once, and I just feel like I gotta go take a very hey boiling hot shower now. Hey, but it's you're, whatever. You're in my space, bro. Yeah, seriously, you're no in doubt. My space right now. If this camera had a wider angle lens, we would be much happier. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, a couple of clowns. I yeah. Swear. Okay. So, vice versa. Very good question. Yeah. It is. It is normal. It, it's still normal to this day in in middle in Middle Eastern cultures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Prince Prince Luke Samuel twenty one thirteen. Yeah. And he changed his be uh, his behavior before them. Actually, parts of India too. Sorry, just had to throw that in. Yeah. It's very common it's, in India. It's, they do um, that too. They hold hands and 
it's something that doesn't happen in the West, but it certainly yeah. happens a lot in other other places. Yeah. Um, I mean, Yeshua kissed John and was cuddling John at the Last Supper. Right on his on his chest, he was holding him. Yeah, he was holding him on his chest. He's like basically cuddling him, and then he kisses him. And so, yeah, if if you read that, you know, the other way, you could think different things. But and some people have, and it makes me really mad when they do. Yeah. So. All right, because they just don't know their culture. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, Phanus Prince Louis Samuel twenty one thirteen, and he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate. And let his spittle fall down upon his beard. The word scrabbled in Hebrew means to set a mark yeah. and is the word tau written in the shape of a cross. Whoa. David was in great danger at, at that time. He wrote uh, in about the time in Psalms 34 and 56 how great Jehovah protected him. Hallelujah. Amen. That is amazing, Fennis. Good find. Oh, that's a come on, mic drop. What are you talking about, Mike Trump? That's like one of these. Yeah. And then it's like one of these because it's the Lord. Oh, what? He get two my girl? Mm -hmm. Tau. Tau written in the shape of a cross. Yeah. Which letters, oh, sorry. Yeah, hit which letter is Tau? Is that? That's Tav, I think. I think he's saying Tav. Oh, is it Tav? It's the last letter. Yeah. Hold on. That's... It's the I one don't want to touch this because every time no, I do no, it, it always wigs it. out. But I, I if think anybody, you guys look it up. If it's Tav, uh, if Thomas, it's if you're listening, if it's Tav, that's the light. That's the last letter. Yeah. That's the one we do for hashtag be the light. I am the Aleph and the Tav. That's what the Lord says. Yep. And you could actually, back then, they could actually refer to God just by saying Tav, by the way. I found that out. So like how they say Yah, yeah. in reference to Yahweh, they could also say Tav and it meant the same thing. And they thing. would be drawing a cross. And they'd be drawing a cross. I mean, come on! I mean, a donkey has a cross on its back. Do I need to say anything more? I mean, I love my Jewish brothers and sisters, but come on, guys, how can you miss this? Okay. Right? All right. Rudy Barlon, in 22-2, David became the leader of those in distress or in debt. Yes. Or the discontented. He became a type of the Savior. Yes. For those who were not the ones that everybody would go after. Yep. And let that be a lesson to us all. Yep. Do not go after the beautiful and the handsome and the, you know, beautifully trimmed beards with the great Ameri great hairdos and you know things like that you know don't go after those ones they don't they go right. they, they're they, here they're going exactly <laughs> <laughs> go after the ones that are you know broken in debt they do beaten dysfunctional amen <laughs> <laughs> you guys are awesome that's why you're here with us. i mean hey uh show grace and it shall be shown on to you <laughs> 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 oh, truer words have not been spoken on True Network. Hey, uh, what did you say that I loved so much? Who did David remind you of with his merry, merry band of misfits? Oh, Robin Hood. Robin Hood. Because he's in the wilderness, he's and they're the all like up in the wilderness, and they're like surviving, and then they're like, you know, doing stuff, uh, and then like here like comes the real life Robin Sheriff Hood. of Nottingham is like, give me your taxes, and he's just like, never. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Okay, the sheriff of Nottingham thing didn't happen, but he was the leader of the poor, the broken, and indebted. Well, the sheriff of Nottingham would have been Saul. He was hiding out from him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Jonathan, or Yahweh, I guess, would be King John. King John is who the good guy is in, right. in the Robin Hood story. Lionheart? King John? My, yeah, Lionheart. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Samuel 24... Um, six. Six. Rudy Barlon. David never saw Saul as his true enemy. He never forgot that Saul was God's anointed. Amen. He saw Saul from God's perspective and never thought of harming him. I want to see all people from the perspective that God created them in his own image and that his desire is for all of them to be saved. Wow, Rudy. Hallelujah. Mm. That's a mic drop. That was a good one. Yeah, yeah that, is what, that, is, that is what we're called to do, isn't it? It is. Do not see with your eyes, but see with the Lord's eyes. Do not hate the sinner, but hate the sin. You guys are awesome. I don't know what I would do without you, because there's no way we would have gotten through this without you. So, thank you guys. Today was a good day. <laughs> even though... There's no even though. It was a good day. No, I'm talking about me. I'm, in, oh. I'm like, whoa, wait. Jennifer yeah, Collins. Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Hebrew word emet, I'm sorry, which means truth. 
The Midrash explains that Emet is made up of the first, middle, and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Mem, and Tav. Mm hmm Yep. Super cool. It's super cool. I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm a little high right now, like Holy Spirit high. Did we do something right? I, I just think that um, I have a lack of sleep, so I feel pretty weird. I think it was what Rudy said that set it up. Yeah. Because Rudy, you nailed it. You, we, did you do a mic drop? I did. I oh, did the Brian good. Kranz one. Fantastic. You guys are the best. It has attitude. That's why I do that one. There we go. Just, you know, it's got attitude. Listen. We're Yeshua Network, <laughs> and when I say we, I mean you. You guys. And I appreciate you guys so much. I also appreciate the fact that you guys have been amazingly patient over the last two weeks, and we're back, by the way. Uh, we, are, we are back to business as usual this coming week, so uh, really excited to have things rocking and rolling. Going to have some new stuff coming up as well to help you with your, uh, your ministries in your house and in real life fellowship, and uh, we're going to try to work out some kind of using an app like Meetup or band or something like that to start putting together meetups in real life. Um, I really believe that it's important that the body of Christ here at Yeshua Network do meet up, start to fellowship, because we don't know how long this whole internet thing is going to be approving uh, this whole Christian or Bible-believing type of thing. Uh, and I, I do feel that it's really important that we uh, we, we get connected on a, on, a, on a next level, the next real level. Amen. Amen. Uh, so yeah, uh, super blessed. So thank you guys very much for that. And I enjoyed today. Today was fun. And this, these scriptures were both very sad, but very also uh, enlightening. Yeah. You know, obviously Yeshua is Yeshua. He's he's the king. He's the king above all kings. Mm -hmm. But um, I think this close study and seeing how David behaves really dawned on me how special David was. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah, he really is. He deserves yeah. he deserves the admiration and honor honoring that he that, gets. that he gets for sure. Yeah. He he is a good king and a good example for all of us yeah. uh, to to uh, be be a person after God's own heart. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys, be blessed, be the blessing, and we will talk to you all soon. Go join those groups: Yeshua Prayer Group, Yeshua Testimony Group. Hashtag be the light and Yeshuans. You can find them on the post I just made. I gave a list to every link for every video series, YouTube, Facebook, and our groups right right below this. So go check that out. Add those. Put them in your favorites on your search engine or your browser, and that way you guys can easily access them uh, because I know there's a lot of things going on, but you guys are doing such an amazing job. Miracles are being performed when you guys are praying for each other, and uh, the ministry that you have is flourishing and it's growing every single day more. So continue it and continue and continue. All right, I'm Nathan Wheeler. I'm Alex Lovovsky. And talk to you soon.